Welcome to Tim with Review, the weekly podcast brought to you by Open Letter and 3%, in which we take one giant book, break it down bit by bit, talk about it, laugh about it, have fun, have a great time. I am Chad Post from Open Letter Books, joined as always by Brian Wood, author of Joy Time Killbox. Um, you said it's a weekly? A weekly yeah, podcast? well, yeah, well, weekly. Just checking. Just checking. <laughs> so Brian is obviously referring to the infamous Lost episode from last week in which 14 seconds appeared on YouTube before my Wi-Fi wouldn't work to save anyone's life. And uh, that podcast is gone forever. I'll <laughs> so, tell you what, it is one of those, it's like one of those Lost tapes. I wish we could have it or find it. Um, so the translator for Vernon Subutex is Frank Wynn. And uh, so I figured since he was doing his thing, I was doing my thing, we would just talk for a little while, even though I didn't record. And our conversations went everywhere from which fan base is worse, Ayn Rand, David Foster Wallace. They're Ooh. both pretty bad. Oh my God. <laughs> we, we talked, we, we were drinking the whole time, obviously. And by <laughs> hour two, boy, we had really, uh, Kate Bush and Tori Amos, we were talking about what's wrong with Spanish translations. We talked about... Uh, what, what did he say was wrong with Spanish translation? That's, you should have been there. I can't. <laughs> no, we, um, we we were talking about like those anthology things that come out, like the Granta ones that always are coming out, and how, what percent of the world, and this also applies to, we were talking about, well, it started because we are talking about, he does other than other books, other than like Parisian, you know, Parisian books. He's currently translating one from uh, Cote d'Ivoire, a book from Habijan. So I was asking about, um, I've been lucky enough to travel around West Africa quite a bit. So I was asking him some stuff about, uh, are there differences between Parisian books, something from, you know, like a city like Abidjan, or if, I don't know if they have books that come from the bush or not, I doubt it. Um, but, uh, and so then we got into the um, Spanish and why do so many of the, why is like Spain the hub for Spanish, Spanish literature when it's really a small, a very small population of Spanish speakers compared to South America, for instance. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, there's this whole Spanish speaking continent over here. <laughs> and so we got into that a little bit. So it was, it was, it was wild. It was fun. Um, Here's, like if you look at it by country, I believe Spain is still on the top, but if you group it by region, South America is far more books translated yeah. than Spain does. Uh, yeah, no, we were like, as far as being like the, like, are they the tastemakers? Are they the trendsetters? Like with, with the magazine, when the Spanish language, best wow. Spanish language stuff comes out, the representation is primarily Spain, Argentina, you know, and like a little bit of maybe Mexico. And then we they'll sprinkle did. in a couple countries here or there, but. We you know. did. It's interesting that you say that. So if you've, if anyone's following along on the 3% website, I will, there will be the rest of the series, but there's a five part series on that new Granta. I'm going to write part three tonight, right after we do this. Oh, I'm, we were talking about the old one though, like the 2011 one. The 2011 one. Yeah. Well, related to that. So um, yeah. I'll just fill this in and this will make sense to you. But um, the, apparently Valerie referenced this series in an upcoming interview for the Los yeah. Angeles Times, which means I actually have to follow through and finish it. Um, but they were all going to look at, each of the five essays was going to look at five of the authors, but then also, nice job, nice way to spell on yourself. Um, the, the is going to look at five authors and like one metric for how to judge success. And so one of them was based on like the number of books that came out of one of the ones I wrote was the number of books that came out from the different countries that were represented in that anthology before and after to see if the anthology sparked people to be like, oh, I don't know about Ecuadorian literature. Let me get more Ecuadorian. And basically the results are inconclusive. Yeah. No, and, and like, you know, from like the Eclipse notes of what we were talking about, I think it really sucks because like, I think it's amazing that there's a magazine that has the, um, you know, like, I don't know about readership, but the distribution of Granta and the uh, clout that Granta has and their willingness to like showcase this kind of stuff. And then like all, for the most part, all like at least academics can do is complain that, the representation isn't correct, or this isn't correct. It's like, well, what the what the hell are we going to do, man? We're trying here. Like, come on. <laughs> like, I think, like, Valerie, like Valerie is a fantastic champion of Spanish literature, I think. And, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah, absolutely. I think there's not like this like great thought that comes into it. They just kind of like shake it out of their sleeve, like, yeah, who, who gives a shit? Whatever. It's like, no, like there's a lot of love, and this is like this is a love letter that they're putting out for us. And 
Of course, the first thing we're going to do is just crap on it. <laughs> whatever. Like. That's, what, that's what everything in sports is taking a shit on it, whatever. Yeah, of course. And then we talked about um, Vladimir Novikov and yeah. which books are okay to completely hate. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, Frank, this? which Frank has something he just definitely is not, not a big fan of. I didn't know if you noticed or not, but he does have, he has strong opinions and he's, he's totally fine basing them in between puffs. Oh, and we talked about cigarettes. Yeah. Because um, he smokes cigarettes, obviously, <laughs> if you watch. And then um, apparently uh, there are different brands, like American brands that we would think would be trashy can be a little more posh in Europe. Yeah. And ones that we think are posh here are trailer trash in Europe. <laughs> Like for instance, Benson and Hedges. Oh yeah, those are like lawyer cigarettes, right? I think of those as like I think of those as like trashy cigarettes, but I don't know. Oh, all the all the people I knew that smoked that were like lawyers or whatever would smoke Benson and Hedges because they were more expen they were more expensive. They made like the extra long one hundreds. They look like really elegant. They come in a really fancy packet, and then um, he says, "Oh no, we call those like ditches and hedges because like." You have to be from the dirt to be smoking one of those. There's like no one would be caught dead smoking those. I remember when I was in Europe, I'd be like, dude, Biz and Hedges are like a dollar here. This is awesome. I was like going around smoking and people were looking at me all like I'm an idiot when I was in Europe in, in like 2002. God. Once when I tried to quit smoking, I tried to make it difficult to smoke by getting like into fancier cigarettes. So I would only smoke Dunhills for a while. Okay. Yeah. That's another one. We, we brought up Dunhills. Um, they're popular in, I think, France, you said? Oh, parliaments were my other one because I think parliaments was for anyone who smoked weed, smoked parliaments. No, parliaments, because of the recess filter that you can click recess when filter. you're yeah. hatching. Yep, yep, yep. Like, like every like dumb college kid smokes parliaments. The I, was, I was before those kids though. I know you were I'm sure you were you were oh. cool before it was cool. <laughs> we were so fucking old, man. I listened to Sunnydale Real Sunny Day Real Estate and spoke Parliament. Sunny Day Real Estate was a real thing when I was in college. Yeah. It's gonna be my 20th anniversary next year. People in Europe smoke Winston's. Mm. That's, like, that's like the like people that are having a hard time at NASCAR smoke Winston's. Yeah. <laughs> so that was a part of the conversation. And so yeah, I mean Man, what a <laughs> disappointment. Like I think I think President Obama smoked Benson and Hedges, which I just thought's hilarious. That it's like the trashiest cigarette possible. <laughs> How great is it? Again, a lawyer, right? Lawyer cigarettes. That's amazing. Um, no, it was a very fun, lively conversation, and I don't know if we talked about Vernon Subutex at all in our conversation, but it was cool. It was just it was just two dudes across the pond from each other, uh, getting hammered by ourselves and then talking literature for like two hours. It's like, a blast. That's what happened when he was on the last time. Really cool. Is, yeah. yeah, he's great. He'll be back really? at the end of the third one. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change the date to a Wednesday to make sure that I have internet because that because of something else. But like we will make sure that he's on here for the third one. Okay. And oh, we're talking about JR and Amos's uh, money. Oh, Amos's money is so good. Yeah, he said that's like the book. I haven't read it, so he's like, you're Brian, you're an idiot and you're not well read and don't know anything. Go read that. He, like that's how that's how I took it, but I'm paraphrasing. But. I think weren't we talking about that when I was like listening to the audiobook of it and I was like, you yeah. need this, you need to listen. Yeah. You need to read this. It's so good. The the movie, I think I mentioned it, but the um London Fields, another of his books that's like absolute masterpiece. There's a movie of it that's one of the few movies that has a zero percent. Zero zero percent on Rotten Tomatoes. I watched it. I thought it was great. <laughs> Actually, that, uh, is that with Amber Heard, I believe? Yeah, and Johnny Depp. And Johnny Depp? Yeah, they what filmed it years ago, and it was never released until like uh, 2020 or something. But yeah, it's, it was I, thought it was, I thought it worked. <laughs> and Billy Bob Thornton. I thought it was like really funny and really, really well, really, you know, interesting. I mean, it's not the greatest movie. I don't, I'm not going to say that, but I, I was entertained. I don't think it deserves a zero. I was just thinking, if they Americanized... If they did an American studio version of Vernon Subatex, I could see Billy Bob Thornton playing Vernon. Oh, you're right. Right? Yeah. Older, he's, better, he's even better than my Paul Giamatti. Oh, way better. Are you kidding me? But you know, like he's like old. He's old. He can look grizzled. Yeah. He can look thin amount, make him like gaunt, look really lean and like hungry and wolf like. Yeah. Um, but then he can also look kind of cool. Like, yeah. If you want, right? If, if maybe like I think Billy Bob Thor could be a really cool Vernon. 
He would be a really cool Vernon. I agree. I agree. I think this book would, or I think this would make an awesome American movie. Um, yeah. When you when you start throwing in the trans the trans characters, the crazy rock stars, the uh, like the Wall Street. Uh, it's just like, it could be so over the top. Yeah, it'd be like out of control. I think people would love it. It could be like one of those movies that's like one of those, uh, who's that fucking like uh, uh, Suicide Squad type director where it's just oh, like God. manic and like over the top. I'll take it back. Don't we, America, please don't touch <laughs> Don't do it. Have you watched <laughs> this, this TV show of it yet? Oh, God. They'll have like Vin Diesel play Patrice or something. Oh, my God. <laughs> There's Vin Diesel and The Rock. Make it too too fast, too furious. But Vernon Super Tech style, that'd be fun. So I have, I have a big, so if you guys haven't covered the end of the last book, the end of the last book, um, they have a big party at Rosa Bonhoor, which I found as I was doing searches is a real place. Um, we I used it as a picture for one of these posts. But uh, in that, Luke gets to meet Pamela Kant finally. She's like flirts with them a little bit. They dance, he gets all grindy grindy. And then he gets jumped in the train station and dies. They all go to his funeral. And essentially you're like, well, this is the end of the, we're all breaking up now sort of feeling. And Aisha and uh, Celeste have to like flee because they're, they've, you know, they're, they, they're hiding from Dopele. Yeah, you know, like when you assault somebody, you usually should probably Lie low for a little while. You should probably bounce when you take somebody, kidnap somebody, and like tattoo them all over their body against their will. Uh, yeah, you might want to. I want to lay a little low to keep in the DL. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just chill for a little bit. Just gonna, just gonna check out. So yeah, so that's where everything was Wait, left there. Before we do the recap, though, I do need to ask you which, uh, which literary fans do you think are worse? The people that want to try to recommend like the fountainhead to you or the people that want to recommend infinite Jest to you? I don't know. I think the infinite Jest people are, are, are sort of just, uh, not both sycophants, right? What's that? They're both like sycophants, the Ayn Rand folks and the, the David Foster Wallace folks. So here's the difference that I see. So the David Foster Wallace people are sort of like to me, cause I love David Foster Wallace. I love infinite Jest. I have no problem mm -hmm. saying that. I don't really recommend it a lot to people yeah. because it already has, its own reputation and recommending it has a reputation. You don't want to be the douche. You don't want to be the douchebag guy. that's like, listen, you need to read this book. It'll change your life. It's like, yeah, no, I use, I, I say Finnegan's wake and gravity's rainbow. Cause I like really like to swing my dick. If I'm making some literary, <laughs> <laughs> literary recommendations. Yeah. Cause there's that essay, right? Like every man recommends this book to me. Yeah. Right? Um, I, I'm drawing a blank on her name. Not Rebecca Solnit, but something like that. No, was it Solnit? No, I don't no, know. She does political stuff. I'm just joking. But it's basically like every dude, every literary dude has to like, you know, like mansplain or say you have to read David Foster Wallace. And, oh my God. <laughs> but, so they are like, like, the, like those, those recommenders are all like of a type and are all like kind of anodyne. Is that the word I'm looking for? There's not really like, Ayn Rand people are scary. Like when they're, even when they're students who are like, I want to write my philosophy thesis on Ayn Rand, like, you know that those people are fucking psychopaths. <laughs> like, they're just straight up psychopaths. Like, the, the DFW people are, like, you know, too cool for school and probably don't get laid very often, but, like, they're they're what they are. The Ayn Rand people are fucking out of their mind and dangerous. <laughs> See, that's what somebody that doesn't like Ayn Rand just says. Yeah. That's, that's you've shut down, you've used uh, one of those, uh, there's this term for it, linguistic term that I learned recently, one of those phrases that you can't argue with, like, Oh, you must be brainwashed. <laughs> you can no longer have a conversation anymore. <laughs> yeah. and, I was, and I realized that I use this technique all the time by using such as baseball, such as life. Like there's no argument. There's no discussion anymore. That's the end of it. So I know we typically like to stick with translated literature. I've never read a single word of Ayn Rand. I, I, oh, I, shit. What would happen if we did one of her books and did a, Two month review of one of her books. We would get the coolest sort of fan base ever. We would have so many, so many people would be re re upping on that and like doubling down on the Ayn Rand of it all. Like she's she's a really bad writer. I think you would hate it so much. <laughs> I, I, I did read The Fountainhead in in college because okay. um, I was curious. Like I didn't. Is that know. the Who is John Galt? Yeah, and, like, they, you know, and I didn't why, know. Why is that a famous line, by the way? I don't remember anymore, man. I could, I could read this out and remember, but I don't want to. But I, what I do remember is that uh, for John Galt, like, uh, who was John Galt, was in 
the bathroom stall at the U of R someone had scratched who is John Galt in the bathroom and someone wrote underneath a fucking freshman. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. We've got some smart kids over there at U of R. Yeah, they're really, they're really, really on their game. But uh, yeah, God, she's so annoying. We should just read the sex scenes. It could be a really good, there could be a really good like two pronged approach to it where one, we could probably get on some Joe really cool guests that are super in, cause it's really, it's really easy to find folks that are really into that and will promote the hell out of it. But two, uh, anybody that follows the show normally will realize we're just making fun of this thing the entire time. But we'll, we'll play it straight to like to these guests and just, just let them like, like just like wade into this like cesspool of shit. And we was yeah. like, yeah, go swim in the deep end. Let's objectivism, man. Let's make it, let's make this happen. Let's make Ayn Rand relevant again. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. All right, sorry. So back to a good book. Ugh. Yeah, so we're on to volume three. Yes. Warren, there's a new dog. It looks like a terrier. Question yeah. Mark. Makes me think of uh, Best in Show, right? Sure. That song about terriers. Oh, I don't. I, I remember the movie, but I don't remember the song. Oh, okay. Man, you should sing it. Um, I think it's got God loves a terrier. <laughs> Something, something, and true, they gave your love to you. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Wait, waiting for Guffman's better, but if you haven't seen, if you haven't seen, um, haven't seen Best in Show, check it out. It's a classic. Waiting for Guffman is great. Yeah. I love that. Although that's that's funny because that like that is like a, a very particular subset of Parker Posey movies as well. Sure. Like she was in everything for so long but that was like one little little corner of her world <laughs> oh man so you get into the part three and i have one big one big thing i want to talk about is okay so there well, this is similar in a way then with book one where it begins with death right yeah because yeah. i'm trying to remember book two doesn't have a death at the beginning of it does it i mean no, unless you talk about uh, vodka satana's death. No, no, no. Yeah, that came a little bit later. Um, yeah, no, it doesn't. Because we get Alex Bleach's death pretty early on in in book one of his friends' deaths, and this one starts pretty quickly um, with. Charles. I know it ends with Luke's death, but this one begins with Charles' death, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's been like three main, I guess, four deaths if you count vodka satana, but she's not on screen. But yeah. the three big deaths would be. Oh, well, Alex Bleach isn't on screen though either, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but Luke and then Charles, who dies at the beginning of this, um, and nobody knows. And that's when everyone finds out that he was a millionaire and he'd won the lottery. Um, yeah. Half the money to Vernon's gang and half the money to his wife. And obviously that seems like that's going to cause some problems within their little commune. Yeah. Uh, like what to do with all this money that they received. Um, but the thing that, that I wanted to tell you about, because you said that you're not familiar with them. And I don't know how many people are listening are, but... Vernon Subutex is Dan Deacon, or Dan Deacon is Vernon Subutex. Dan Deacon's like a famous, like electronic uh, musician who uh, does a lot of like very high energy, manic sort of like dance music, experimental, but strange and catchy in various ways. He's like one of my favorite, favorite artists. And I've seen him a billion times. And one of the things that he's well known for is that during his concerts, he makes everyone dance and everyone does these weird group dance things together. Like he will, he will have like, you have to start doing things in a certain pattern as the song starts. And then he'll like add things to it and people will react. And like these whole crowds of people will move almost in, in unison, but not, they're not doing like the same dance moves, but they're like as one, like as an organism doing a thing. So there's like a lot of videos of uh, YouTube videos online trying to capture like the weird nature of like his his performances. And there's ones where like, he'll like have people split up, split up the dance floor in half and people on one side will dance like they're uh, part of Lethal Weapon 3 and the other people will dance like they're uh, on Michael Jackson's Neverland Ranch and like just nonsense descriptors that get people like into it. And he uses like a lot of like uh, musical like uh, changes and rhythms and whatnot to like try and like impact the world. And he has like a very hippie sensibility to it. His most recent album came out last year um, and is very much like about his spiritualism and whatnot. But he has a new radio. The reason I was thinking about it, he's in a new radio show called Distorting Time in which he wants to essentially change consciousness <laughs> through two hours of unabridged music. 
of extended length. And he says something like, I love long form music and I love the collective shared yet distantly separated experience of listening on the radio. There's something about the waves traveling through the air that adds magic to music. Um, da, 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 da. It's suited for after hours listening. But he's like, yeah, he's like doing this weird shit of like trying to, trying to like change consciousness through this. And it's like so much like Brennan Subutek's setup. And like the convergences do sound like Dan Deacon concerts where it's like this sort of like freak folk hippie sort of vibe, like electro hippie sort of people um, that are all like letting go. Like the whole thing is like letting go. And like you never dance, you'd be standoffish about it. And then you're there and you're like, oh, I'm here. I'm into this. I, 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 mean, I don't dance, but I dance at his things. <laughs> He sounds like somebody that would like uh, smoke weed on a balloon oh, like fuck a yeah. and watch Ancient Aliens. He has one song in which it's like, um, there's a song that's just this guy like from uh, from Long Island talking, like, saying like crazy shit, like watching a TV station and changing channels and just responding to it. And it's in like a really heavy like Long Island accent and really like bro and weird. And um, the rumor was always that he got super high on acid and just recorded it in one take in a closet. <laughs> Which totally tracks. We'll get a couple of coffee down by the diner. Yeah. Right, we'll get... Look at that. That guy is Mr. Balloon Hands. Look at Mr. Balloon Hands over there. What you can do with those balloon hands? <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. But he's so he's so cool. And uh and I and I and I if you if you go into like the idea of like these sort of convergences or these meetings of like music and like community, like he is that same th those two things are parallel. Are they they're the same yeah. concept? Dan Deacon and, and Vernon's stuff. Yeah, I find it interesting that we kind of have skipped over how the cult really started, and we're just kind of in the cult now. Yeah, and I like how you use cult. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it kind of is a cult, right? I mean, kind of a cult. Yeah, it feels like it. It has a, it has a culty vibe to it. Where you know, someone gets to sleep around a lot with a bunch of people, and they're popular, and has like these groupies that look up to him and fawn. That's got all the cult. It has all the Netflix documentary cult vibes to it. So this is also not meant to be a segue, but to be an addition. There's a book that came out on Tuesday by Amanda Montrell called Cultish. That's about the language used in cult in cults. Um, but the cults range from like Heaven's Gate and like uh, Jonestown, yeah. um, whatever people's, people's, not people's garden, whatever it was, people's temple. Um, but then through like, to like soul cycle and CrossFit yeah. and to like social media, social uh, media gurus and like how they all use language in a very similar way that like creates this cult like thing. And part of her beginning, um, like the wave. Was, what's that? The wave. The wave. <laughs> you remember that? It happened in Palo Alto. A teacher in Palo Alto created yeah. a neo-Nazi cult with his students to show how easy it is to, to get wrapped up in things. And they made that terrible movie about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was called The yeah. Wave. Yep. <laughs> is, I mean, it's fascinating. The language part of this is, I mean, she's a linguist, so it's all about like social linguistics and like Ooh. what you do with like how you separate, like there's different ways in which you create an us versus them. And then you create like a coercion sense and you like create your own um, words or like portmanteaus that don't refer to things or change the way that words are typically used to give you power. Like it's all really fascinating. And as the first part of it in the intro, she talks about um, like what is a cult and that it's a very slippery it's a very slipperly defined idea because there's like a fanaticism, but there's like a community to it. There's frequently what we think of as like the cult leader who does all that kind of stuff. But then there's other definitions of cult that like would fit, but you wouldn't say that they're dangerous. Like a cult doesn't have to be dangerous, but yeah. it can still be a cult. Like people who say like, like soul cycle or like Peloton, like I, and then she starts with like the phrase drink the Kool-Aid and like how offensive drink the Kool-Aid is. I, I was just saying that like, do you know what Jonestown is like, do you know how awful that is? Do you realize and, how, and you know, they didn't even get Kool-Aid. They got yeah. flavor aid. Yeah. Can't it wasn't even a name brand fruit. Punch. It was fruit punch beverage. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the, there's people who the survivors are like, when people say that it gives me like the shivers. Cause like nobody in, nobody took the Kool-Aid. They were like held at gunpoint to drink and kill themselves to or to step over to the other world and like the tape that they have of like of him giving his final 45 minute death speech to everyone it's creepy as shit but yeah it's really interesting and like the language of like the cults of language that you use here is like not dissimilar from that yeah i mean I, I grew up in the bay area so like everybody around there like probably through one, one or two three degrees of separation knew somebody that died in jonestown basically oh my god because yeah. most of them are from like San, the San Francisco area, I believe. 
time. Yeah, and I mean, it was because of the 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 senator from California going to Guyana that set it all off when they tried to when the people tried to escape and they shot him and shot everyone. And yeah, then so you know, cults and politicians. It like it makes me think of like that the Marjorie Green lady that's in Georgia, the Congresswoman. Um, you mean the most sane woman in America? Yeah. Cause she's like a crazy CrossFitter person and also a Q and on like it, like, and like an AR 15 person like this, I believe CrossFit was started by an ex Navy seal or something. Uh, yeah. like, it all like fits perfect with this type of like and, vibe. And CrossFit, was, CrossFit was one of the perfect examples in her intro too, where like, you don't say you don't go to the gym, you go to the box. You don't do like, like all the terms are changed. And so they, they're, they're new terms for what you're doing that are just like, exercise or whatever like we have words for this but by using a new terminology then you create a camaraderie around the people who are part of it and the people who aren't who don't understand you are the others and it sucks because and, and I, this will segue <laughs> nice and, this will segue nice into the book because like at its at its core crossfit's great like it's people getting into fitness and wanting to be healthy and live better stronger lives like great or and they think about exactly. When you, when you think about things like with like branches of Christianity that like that go down into like the, they, usually they want to like do something better to improve their lives or to make a difference. Like there's there's always like a like a kernel of something good that is built around, but it just becomes so just like I don't know. The more you buy into it, the more terrible and awful and malignant and ugh it becomes. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting that that Kiko was looking at what's happening with Vernon and his followers, and he starts thinking about L. Ron Hubbard. Yes, yes. He even mentions like, hey, you could be Jesus, and Bleach can be like, you're John the Baptist. Like, yeah. we, we, we can actually market this, we can roll with this. This is gonna be a lot bigger than you want it to. Like he's already like, <laughs> the <mind laughs> is going of like, how, how awful can we make this and exploit <laughs> this? <laughs> Tom Cruise should play Kiko. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but, but that's why I think this cult talk is actually perfect, especially when when talking about this Church of Vernon that's happening, because yeah. it it has some culty vibes, and then and then here is Kiko, like seeing it, like oh yes, it's like this is totally a cult. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm down with that as long as we can make some money off of it. And it's totally Nexium, this shit, man. Let's blow it up. Make it cool. So I, I thought that was very funny. It's super funny. It's super, it's, it's really interesting because it is, and, and they are starting to get into, so I, I think one of the, one of the, 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 the sort of waves or patterns that happens with this book too, is that initially you have Vernon trying to get to, yeah, nice, nice uh, wave reference there, but um, you have Vernon trying to like find a place to live and it's like individual in that sense. And at this point we're at a communal level where they are trying to have their commune or like these, these ways that now he's living so far off the grid, like he's just taking care of. And like in every regard by playing like shows once a month, like he's, they, they, they've moved into, it's moved, the books have moved into a realm of like the social. And it's, if part of the book's kind of emphasis is to how to take off, how to take down the structures, how to take down the dopalays, the people in power, how to, how to undercut that through music or through community, we are at the point now, can you build something outside of that? Um, and Kiko is one of those connector points. She's like, essentially, no, like he would co-opt you right back in. You can't be outside of the system of Kiko's, the Kiko's of the world would want you to be back. Well, Kiko's conversation with Charles, when we get the yeah. interlude between getting his, when the interlude between um, Vernon getting his tooth drilled and it cuts to memories of Charles, it's going back and forth, right? Mm -hmm. like the death of this tooth and then the death of his friends going back and forth between the two. And there's that conversation, um, really it's a monologue like the greed is good monologue um, <laughs> with Kiko, right? Who, who we were calling Gordon Gecko earlier, but <laughs> where he's like, yeah, like screw you guys. We like <laughs> automation. We don't need you anymore. Like keep, just stay poor. Why should we ever have you be anything more than what you are? Like you are, you are fodder for our machine and we are okay with that. That is, that was one of the darkest parts of this book. And then <laughs> like, not realizing the whole time he's talking to a millionaire. Yeah. Yeah, of course, that was doubly good. But this millionaire whose whose main goal with his millions is to make a Z movie about zombies and and uh, ex porn stars. But I thought, oh man, Chad's gonna hone in on this because this, this is some 
dark stuff. <laughs> oh, dark. I, I do with the zombie thing. I love the porn star. who's like, oh, I had, I'm explaining how she would like fuck a zombie's mouth with a strap on. I was like, yes, this is this is a good section of the book for me. <laughs> I'm here for this. <laughs> is it a little deviant? Yep. Oh, oh there we are. <laughs> like, we can make that a comic. It'd have to be the uh, the author of uh, Bitch World. Oh yeah, Scott, 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 not Bitch Planet. World. Bitch Planet. Planet. Yeah, Bitch Planet. Yeah, Kelly Sue DeConnick. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. dude, give that material to to Kelly. Hell yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> I would love that. I would be there for that for sure. It's interesting. Kiko's like all involved up in it now. I love that. I love that Kiko too. Like quits being a trader and just buys a bunch of weed. Starts investing weed in LA. Yeah, smart man. Yeah, he's such a strange. I don't know. If, I don't even know if you can call him an ally. I mean, I guess you can because he does have, you know, he is helping out in some ways. But yeah. it's just a strange. And I guess it goes. I guess it goes back to like with cults. Like you get all types. Like I don't know if if you go to church, there'll be like rich people, poor people, like just a bunch of people that are really like getting the good vibes and like doping up on that nice feeling. But you yeah. get all sorts and all walks and all whatever. And if it's under the if it's under the roof of the church and that's what knits them together, like you can get a weird ragtag group of people together. Yeah. 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 I mean, like that's the Nexium issue. Yeah. I mean, that, that was, I mean, the cult slash MLM slash whatever you want to call that, wherever you want to place that within the, the spectrum, like those people were, were astronomically wealthy that were like really bankrolling parts yeah. of that. Um, I mean, granted, it's like maybe they're bankrolling it for like sex trade reasons, but like, but the two women, the Seagram's fortune were like behind that. And then the whatever the Supergirl, uh, Superman, Smallville, Smallville actress, um, Allison, whatever, like those are people that are like, okay, like usually I think of like cults too, is like someone who's like trying to trying to trick people. I don't know her name, but my, I remember my roommate in college had the hugest crush on her because Smallville was like early 2000, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, Ellison Mac, Ellison Mac. Okay, he had a huge, huge crush on her because wow. he was he was Asian. He's like, I see, like she's kind of Asian. I'm liking this. It's like we get those are my people on screen. I'm liking this. Yeah. Like, who, who is this person? It's, this is like Superman. Without it. Like, there's not even Superman in this, right? Watch Lois and Clark. At least there's like a Superman outfit. <laughs> Set a bunch of teenagers. Go get you some Terry Hatcher. Could <laughs> you some Terry Hatcher? Now you're now you're appealing to me, man. Now you're speaking my language again. This is gonna turn into the mom podcast soon. Yeah, I don't know. Again, I, I feel like there's these different modes with each book, right? Mm-hmm. It's, um, it's subtle. Yeah, because like to me, the second book had more of like a detective vibe to it, and then this one, it's flipped. It's got a different switch where like that's all that's all gone now, and like the the. To me, it's kind of like they're like, it's like entrepreneur, like there's entrepreneur spirit in this one where like something is being built and we're watching what's going to happen and how it affects everybody. And I don't know. I mean, it's interesting to pair Kiko and Dopele in this part that we read as two of the sections because Dopele is like both all fucked up from having been like kidnapped yeah. and tattooed. And he's like nervous and jittery and like whatever and can't focus on anything. And he's still like the producer asking people to like, read scripts for him and explain what he needs to know and needs to do. And like, he's still in control. Like he's still like making massive decisions for like culture um, yeah. in that way, even though he's also like fundamentally been uh, scarred in his, in his like soul and in his like sense of like of self by having been invaded that way. So it's a really interesting, uh, interesting dichotomy. And then you have Kiko, like you say, like trying to co-opt this on, on yeah. some level. Who's like, I can pay for all of your like dental work or whatever, but like, mm-hmm. It ain't no big deal, but like we could also like make a lot of money. It kind of, rem- yeah, it's kind of like everything's, it's- transaction- everything's kind of transactional and centered yeah. around money in this first one because you get you have the death of Charles and his money and his money, right? And so, where is, is her name? Vero, 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 yeah, yeah. Um, she's saying, I don't, you know, I want to keep the inheritance myself. And, I've, yeah. and there's even talks about working out what the taxes are going to be on it. Everything has like this transactional economic and yeah. and then you get Kiko, right? And then you get Dopele. Like, so you get, you get all these like money power players, like bang, 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 bang. And so, yeah. and, then, and then the talk of like power structures and we don't need the poor anymore or we want you poor. I don't care. Like 
everything is centered around money at the beginning of this. So I, I don't. It's, yeah. it's really interesting. Like it, this is a different mode compared to book one or book two. And that's it has their own kind of feel. Like I like that about it. Me too. Me too. And it is it is subtle, and it is like like you say, it's like the motifs, and it is the sort of orchestrating of like mm -hmm. where the sequencing comes, yeah. the different people's perspectives. And I think that's why, like, even not having been on last week, but talking about the end of that book, one of the things I really like about the end of the of of two was that Luke has his moment where he comes to. I was gonna say comes to Jesus, but that's not right. But he like opens up his mind, comes into like a new form of consciousness. No, that's right. He has like this awakening. Like, his awakening. Yeah. Pamela Khan. And then like um, when he gets beaten and killed, like the last chapter isn't a single consciousness. It's like all of them. Like it keeps jumping. It's one of the only chapters that has like many people's voices within it. Well, um, how good would that be to film uh, Danielle at the? neo-nazi funeral yeah just, yeah just, just all beautiful this beautiful trans man all tatted up looking around like yeah. i don't know as far as neo-nazi <laughs> <funeral goes, laughs> that's not that <laughs> they're all kind of ugly <laughs> like, which, is, which is a thing um, yeah that the funeral scene would be a wonderful set piece because you'd have like yeah. this funeral and then you have the bar and everyone just is ending up at the bar like giving up on the church at one moment or another of like won't go in there or like or like leaves or like whatever but you then end up with that huge bar experience I mean it is a really cinematic setup and it is it has, like the, trying to get like all the voices in there and trying to create something that's sort of sort of different sort of not not like your typical um not like your typical way of doing things that there is some some otherness to it some yeah, other, it, alternative. And it doesn't make sense when I'm saying it out loud. It doesn't make sense when I'm thinking it. So it probably won't make sense when I say it. But um, it's it's such a like broad and eclectic cast. But at the same time, it doesn't feel too big or too expansive. No. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's easy enough to recognize who people yeah. are yeah. reading one after another. I think it, with like year apart for each one, it's a little bit harder. But like, yeah, everyone's pretty much. Yeah, it's not too big. Even Vero, Vero's interesting. Let's talk about her in a second. But one thing that 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 tied into that for me was that this is not the first time it's happened. But where Vernon has an interaction with someone and his like complete honesty of like emotion and self like breaks through to them. So there's the times where he's hugged people and that's become like a major thing. And in this case, when he just starts crying, oh, crying. Is, then Vero's like, okay, I was supposed to give you half the money. I have to do it because he's going to hate me from beyond the grave, blah, blah, blah. And she like breaks down. But he's like, he's the only character that exhibits like their pure emotion in this, this, this way, this like unspoken ineffable way, rather than like they use their words to try and attack things and belittle things or categorize them. They use like their tattoos to like get revenge. I mean, there's, there's all these people doing things to like engage with the outside world and to impact the outside world. And his way of doing it is essentially to like lose everything and be like a person who's there, you know, like hugging someone, shaking their hand, crying in front of them, being like present in that way. And that is that guru vibe going back to the cult part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it happens in, in both instances, it happens I don't know how far off, but you know, it's not immediate with the death. It's like long after the death, mm -hmm. right? Because with the yeah. when he broke down, he was watching the video when they all got together and watched the Alex Bleach video, and then like it it hits hard enough where he just starts he cracks. It's and then with this, like Charles has been dead for a little while, you know, and the inheritance stuff has come out and all that stuff, and then like it it hits for him, or maybe yeah. it's just the tooth pain. Maybe it's just the tooth pain and the uh, <laughs> and the good the good drugs. And the drugs. So. <laughs> lucky man, lucky man, getting those, getting those good, good, sweet dentist drugs. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't really need those. But v Vero is interesting too because she, she is like one of the things I think is, uh, is uh, like sad, just desperately sad about her is her realization of her alcoholism and like the decline of it. Where I th there's a line somewhere in there where she's like, you know, until you're 30, it's fine. And then it's like a slow decline to 50. And then that last 10 years is fucking rough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I only have five good years of alcoholism left, Brian. What am I going to do? <laughs> Better get started. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta keep this going. Um, but she's she's so sad and so. Age 37. The problem is, booze takes time to kill you. 
it'll get there, that's for sure, and you know it. But it's so slow. It's horrendous. At least with cigarettes, the day you're diagnosed, the kick up the ass, and that's and that's that. You're dead and buried. Not booze. From the first time a doctor says, if you carry on going, or if you carry on, you're going to die, to the day you finally snuff it, you've got 10 years left. Easy. And not the best one. <laughs> no oil painting, Vero. She wouldn't live with herself <laughs> if she had this choice. She wouldn't want to wake up and see her face on the pillow. Charles was ugly too, but he had no one else to bring her to bed. You have to be pragmatic. And she hates being alone. It's so it's so good. It's so like it is very like heartrending. And it's it's interesting when she's like, I wish I could finally talk to him. Yeah. And just above that is the one you're talking about. Booze makes you bright eyed and bushy tailed until you're 30. After that, it's a gentle slope until you hit 50. And the last part of the journey is the ugliest. After the menopause, good God, she turned into a monster. Puffy, red faced, her whole body deformed from cheap wine, her eyes swimming in idiocy. Yeah. I, wrote, I wrote in the uh, the margin on mine, Nick Nolte. Oh my God! Yeah, <laughs> that dude. That dude went from sexiest man alive to the crazy <laughs> Malibu mugshot in like fifteen years. Yes, that's, that's what happens. Nick Nolte and Gary Boosie. <laughs> Mel Gibson. That's another one. Mm -hmm. Lord. Who's well, not sure? Who's an anti-Semitism? You put those together, give twenty years of that. Oh, good lord! You <laughs> fall apart. Um, I love that how she gets fired. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> we have to talk for another one. one. That was another one. I, I have to admit, what, did you rape the whole class? How do you get fired <laughs> from <the> school? <laughs> it's one of the funniest lines of the three books. I have to oh, admit man. that. That one of my greatest fears in life is that's how I'm gonna get fired. It's like just just getting some like pissy email from my boss while I'm drunk and being like, you know what? I got some words. And then like the next morning waking up and being like, what are Oh, I what have I done? Oh no, I actually hit send on that. <laughs> there's a there's a Charles Baxter essay about that called Mistakes Were Made. Oh really? <laughs> It's a great essay. He talks about the difference. Used to, we said we fucked up. Now we say mistakes were made. <laughs> <laughs> mistakes were made. Um, yeah. So here's her, here's her part where she gets fired. So she's like a good teacher, which is like also one of these heartbreaking things. You're, like, you're a real champion. You are. I've never heard of a teacher being fired. Did you rape the whole class of kids? I can't see it happening otherwise. Page 40. Yeah. Oh my God. And then 43, she's like, the principal had the bright idea of sending a short, irritating message, inventing time she was late for the sole pleasure of making her blood boil. She was drunk when she read it. She wrote several pages of insults, entirely deserved and expressed with the honesty that booze inspires. <laughs> then, then the following morning, the pussy only had to print, press print, file a police complaint alleging death threats, and notify his superiors. <laughs> that's, that's that. <laughs> Canceled! That's... <laughs> Let's get canceled. Yep, yeah, that's how they get you. That's how they get you. They they trick you, bait and switch, give you a little bit of anger, and then you just like tell them the truth, and boom, you're over. Yeah, there's some. There were some like close to tender parts, but it's mostly funny parts. I thought of this in this yeah. opening. I don't know when when it's dealing with economics, I just get pretty crass for the most part. It's like JR yeah. mode, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And is there's one one thing worth noting is that Antoine is helping his dad out a little bit by helping him get a new tattoo. So Dopele decides that since he can't have rapist and murderer across his back, because now when he when he fucks his side pieces, he doesn't want to take off his shirt. He uh he his son suggests getting it covered up. So he gets uh removed partially and is getting a giant samurai cutting apart a dragon on his back. Go with the Yakuza tattoo. <laughs> So culturally inappropriate and amazing. <laughs> and like this dude's like 50 years old, which is what we figured out before. So this 50 year old dude is like, you know what I want? I want a big old dragon slaying uh, samurai. No, nope. I used to, we used to joke, um, uh, Will Evans and I came up with the thing once when we were like, when he was here for the summer that for 4th of July, we should get like tattoos that are like uh, a, a bald eagle like ripping out of your back from your spine and just says, fuck yeah, America, across the whole thing. I had a friend, uh, He Will, Will Evans has a lot of tattoos, right? He's, oh, yeah. He's all sleeved up and more than that, I'm sure. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a friend that was like, had a ton of tattoos and when he was just starting to get them, there was a tattoo parlor, like right after 9-11, I was giving like free patriotic tattoos. He was like, free tattoo, I'll take one. And he just got like a giant boat, USS Constitution on his chest. <laughs> like, are you into like naval warfare? He's like, no, nah, it was free. And like a sailboat on your chest is awesome. God, this is why I don't have enough tattoos. <laughs> like, I, was, uh, I wish I could make life choices like that. Like, I like sailboats. Let's do it. Yeah, I want. Yeah, I wish I could make life choices. <laughs> you can stop there. Yeah. I just like bumble fuck along as I go down the path of like willy nilly, live life and uh, man. I do like. Um, I don't know how how it would connect or not, but um, in the King Kong theory, there. Are, I forget the title of the essay. I believe it was like, you can't rape someone who's a total whore or something along those lines. Right. Um, but she talks about how guys go around and, you know, we use terms like assault, sexual assault, or it got a little rough or, you know, this or that, but people don't like to use the word rape. Yeah. Um, and like, I'm wondering if Dopale thinks of himself as a rapist or not. That's funny that you say that because the part that I was going to quote from him on 71 is, uh, and he also recognizes himself in those men unjustly accused of sexual harassment when they are guilty of nothing more than freely expressing their desires. He's in yeah. a self-different era when men and women knew how to give each other pleasure. Yeah. Because uh, to me, it makes me think of like the college, like college culture and how much rape takes place in college, but it has a different name yeah. because it's probably nobody would ever send their kid to college if they if we call it rape and it, and it is expressed that way and how prevalent it is and how much it happens you know it goes back to that um the uh the uh the essay i'm forgetting her name where she's like if you want to pagilia yeah the 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 camille the camille essay where it's like if if you want to if you want to send, if you want to go out in the world where men are, just be like the contract is you could get raped. Like that's all there is to it. And now go out. Cause, cause like, I don't know. I, I thought it was really, really interesting. He's just like going to get it covered up because well, like, I don't know. I don't know if that character would think he's a rapist. No. Yeah. Just be like, Oh, I got a little rough or she didn't say no loud enough or, you know, whatever, whatever the, yeah whatever the um, excuse is going to be. There was, wasn't there, yeah, I mean, essentially, like, isn't there, I mean, he's really horrific in here, but also, like, we'll come around to this in a second. With his horrific part, one of the parts is says something like, um, he should never have been Vodka Satana's friend. He should have just, like, fucked her at a sex party and, like, let it go at that and not try to help her. Like, and he doesn't see that as, like, anything wrong or anything, like, questionable. Yeah. But he's also, like, after this assault, become, like, uh, and become the the sort of Joe Rogan anti anti PC thing where he's like I'm not going to say I'm not going to hold my tongue. He's no longer going to hold his tongue for fear of upsetting some snowflake. He's determined to trade blow for blow in every sphere. So he's, he's, really, he's he's a victim now. Yeah, he's a victim now. He's like ready to fuck people up. Yeah. Which look out, man. That's dangerous. Yeah, here it is. Here's the thing they're sticking about. That was where it all had started. Oh wait, back up here. Um, if he had been stricter, clear, and less indulgent with himself, he would never have taken it into his head to have any dealings with Vodka Satana that might be construed as a friendship. He would happily have screwed her in the context of a fuck party. Why not? But would he, but would never have stooped to having a conversation with the mad bitch. That was where it all started with the idiotic notion that it was possible to have relationships with people from inferior social classes. Good God. Yikes. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's some dark shit too. Yeah. Yeah. And like, yeah. Yep. And I feel like after reading it's, I, I don't want to connect the two books cause they're completely different, obviously, but I feel like you get a good idea of, of where DuPont's coming from with King Kong theory and like, yeah. kind of, um, what, she, what she's done, how she's lived her life and how, like what her worldview is and how it's, you know, how her experience has shaped how she's going to write her fiction in some ways. Um, but I can't help but see some of it echo in these characters and, you know. Absolutely. I mean, it's really smart of FSG to bring out both at once, like three yeah. and, and that one. Um, this is, again, like going back to like our very first episode, this book came out 
volume three came out mid two months review and I didn't even notice anyone talking about it. Hmm. Or King Kong theory. I don't pay attention to any of that. So I don't know. I don't really either. So I might be missing something, but it like things percolate. Although I did delete Twitter from my phone uh, after looking at someone's Twitter feed, but um, so I don't really know what's going on, but the, yeah. uh, very brave chat. Very brave. I was like, standing strong yeah. it's like oh this is cool i love when people subtweet about me um the uh the <laughs> but king kong theory is so early and this is so matured that like it doesn't, it makes total sense it very much feels like a circle or like ends of a parentheses or whatever where like the beginning viewpoint and then this later viewpoint and like one of the things with dope too that's worth noting is like how anti-semitic he is within here in this section where he's just like you know, you know, he can't say it, but the fucking Jews are the ones that are taking over everything. And one of the things that's interesting I found is that a lot of times when she references French intellectuals, I don't know who they are. Do you know who they are? Um, like there's one in here, Zamoon. No. Um, and that he's complaining about where he's like, shut the fuck up. I don't, read, I don't read or hang out with any intellectuals because it would just ruin my reputation and and who I am. So. I, yeah, I mean, <laughs> stay true, man. Stay yeah. true. The, uh, so I, I looked it up, and it's like all these intellectuals that she does tend to reference um, within the book are like the very controversial and very like on the fringes of stuff intellectuals. And it's very, it's interesting because they're very right wing, but like right wing in that French way where it's like, oh, well, it's like, you know, also blah, blah, blah. But, um, yeah, that, that was that was one thing I started to pay attention to is like all these names I don't recognize. I'm just looking up. Okay. And they'll have like a story behind them or a, something behind them that's very curious. Hmm. Yeah, so, but I think so far with this first section, the thing that really stood out to me is it's very economic. Yeah, yeah, economic, and we're getting our getting our commune. This is the time. This is when I referenced it with Derek, but this is our uh, Gen X uh, utopia. Gen this is the Gen X utopia. We're all living off the grid, hanging out, listening to some good electronic and other musics, um, musics of all all varieties. Let when I was in high school, it was when like the big like Berkeley warehouse rave scene was happening. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and this has that kind of vibe. It reminds me of that too, where it was like an electronic church. Yeah. Like you, would go to, you would, you know, your Maybe your biology teacher is there because he made ecstasy in the back room because he knows how to do chemistry or whatever. And As you do. Wear really baggy clothes that have too many zippers. Yeah. Uh, Pouches. Glow stick shit. You, you go to a warehouse party and then. Mm -hmm. like very we, take this feeling and do something good in the world with it. Oh, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 But you know what? But you're together and you're like high and you want to just like give love and all that kind of stuff. I think that like, I think there's like, I mean, there's a cynical way and a positive way to look at it too. Cause yeah. it's also like, like it's the way that I would make fun of like uh, Grateful Deadhead. The Deadheads mm -hmm. when I was in college were like at their nadir. They or, had been Dave like, Matthew, or Dave Matthews band. The, nowadays, yeah. Oh. Dave Matthews was just coming into existence when I was in college, but uh, Jerry Garcia died. And like, it was like that transition into the, through the fish and Dave Matthews version where like the real people who had been really like the people had been already parodied. And so like, it was like, everyone felt like a parody of that, of like, yeah. oh yeah, you're like a deadhead who buys your shit at like the fancy store on Grand Avenue. Like that's not really what this is supposed to be. Like you're not, you don't have a trust fund to go follow the Grateful Dead. Like everything felt like a, an imitation and like it had been codified or it had been uh, co-opted and turned into a money-making machine and blah, blah, blah. And at the same time, it's like with the Dan Deacon concerts, like there is something about it that is very pure and true. And like, it's hard to let that be when you know that there's a lot of Kikos in the world and there's a lot of like nonsense in the world. But it's also like, I don't know, it's not bad. I don't, I don't wish harm on these, these commune people. I want them to like, I want them to fuck up the world. I want them to like show people that you don't have to like always try and get the cool garden level apartment in Brooklyn. And like, that's the only way that you can become an important person that there's other ways. And like, there's other ways of thinking and you don't have to listen to top 40 music. You can listen to things that are eclectic and weird and like that things are open. Like, yeah, isn't this, I mean, ideal is ideally what the values that they're presenting are the values that I want for the world. Yeah. 
but I don't know if they'll succeed. Yeah. Last question I have for this section. Um, do you think, uh, like, why is Vernon doing what he's doing? Well, I think he's like, I think he's on it. I think he's elevated. I'm going to use, I'm going to use cult terminology. I think that dude is elevated. Like oh, there's he, a line early on he where he's he like, leveled up anymore. What's that? Yeah. Vernon no longer fears boredom or loneliness or silence or obscurity. He has changed a lot. Drugs are no longer of any use to him. I think he's like on a new plane and he's just like, this is wonderful. Like I just go through life, like making these amazing things happen. You can watch people like, could you imagine being in control of like two iPads and a microphone and uh, to go back to our earlier joke and like watching like this mix of people just like enjoy the shit out of their lives. Like if I could make one person enjoy the shit out of their life, that would be a fucking major accomplishment. If you can make like hundreds of people enjoy their life for hours, that's your God, your God at that moment in time. Yeah. It's, there was a um, anecdote I heard from a uh, jazz musician who played with Miles Davis. And he was talking about the power and the control that Miles Davis had over crowds when he was playing. And like he would get, it was like you would get drunk on the power of it. Yeah. And in particular, um, I think this goes with this cult vibe, what you're seeing with, with Vernon and what happens in cults. But in particular, what Miles would do in these clubs was he would, when he was playing his trumpet, he would point it at somebody that he was attracted to and play towards their their vagina, basically. So, and, and he would keep playing until he would watch this person slowly start to spread their legs because it feels good, the music, they're feeling the music vibrating in their body. And like, that was what he was drunk on, that power of, one, I, I, I like the music, but I like controlling people. And I like making their bodies move, whether they know it or not, from the sonic pulse that's coming out of my instrument. And I'm wondering if that's something that's going on with, with Vernon, where like getting people to dance, getting people to like, like be next to each other, to, to end up having sex or like having control of people. And then like them to be attracted to him and to, like, is he buying into that? Is that part of like who he is now? Is that like his thing? I, don't, I, I think he's, I think it's not because I think that the, the I think that his sexual uh, peccadillos or whatever um, are too like- Too big of a word for me. Too big of a word for me too right now. Yeah. Uh, the, but I like, they're like inconsequential and random. So like yeah. he talks about like all these women are after him because of his his power, his like ability to to change minds and create this thing, whatever. But like he has a steady girlfriend, and he like is like with her, like and it's not. He's like, yeah, oh, that line is gonna be my line. I know what line my line is. The, Mar the Mariana line. Yeah, Mariana line. Is that the same one for you? No. Okay, but uh, but uh, but talking about like fucking her is like really specific and i think that he doesn't like he doesn't seem he doesn't seem corrupt yet there's nothing corrupt about him and this is that point of the culture the no, point Mariana, of that's pure that's that feels corrupt. very pure and real and and like just like beautiful like that that relationship feels really good but boy it's gotta it's gotta go bad it has to because <laughs> kiko's involved right like it's gotta go it's gotta go bad kiko's gonna kiko's gonna, kiko's gonna <laughs> Maybe. So no, that's like one of my curiosities is like, does Vernon's idea of being this shaman and this ringleader, is he cool with it? Or is it part of just like, this is what I have to do to survive? Well, I'm, I th I'm so curious what his, what his, uh, what his motives are for being in that role and staying in that role. Let's frame that for next week in the sense that like right now he might be pure and good about it, but he also just found out he has a shitload of money. Yeah. And he even says something to the effect of like, oh, I can't tell people, like that'll change everything. The mm -hmm. money's gonna ruin it. Yeah. Like if you're here, if you're here for the right reasons, it works. If you're here for the money, it's not gonna work. Right. So that could be the beginning. So what's your favorite line? I'll go find mine. I'll go find my this is a dirty podcast that we do. <laughs> no, it's not. Not all the time. Uh where is um, it? I had, a, I had a couple, but this one on, on uh, page 10 worked really well I, I, for the times that we're in right now. Um, and this is like, I guess, people talking about 
the vibrations and what's going on, how things work, or maybe think about QAnon or Wuhan leaks or whatever, like just all sorts of like fun stuff that are in the <laughs> or in the ether right now. Give them an opportunity to expound their theories, and you can find yourself going down some very strange paths. <laughs> It just feels like the world we're living in. Yeah, yeah. People will have a platform to expound on their theories, and boy, I'm in the weeds now. I have a, I have a very funny anecdote to share with you after we hang up, because I don't uh, think I need to share it here. But uh, uh, the one that I have is uh, from page eight. They spend their time listening to music, and Vernon feels as though he's gained a friend as well as a lover who seems like a mermaid when she fucks. Her whole body undulates, seduces, profits, and provokes. She pours into sex and into dance everything she cannot put into words. Yeah. So I didn't go dark. I went fucking horny. There you go. You've been listening to Duran Duran too much, huh? We just did. Yeah, we just <laughs> I just changed. I just, I call that code switching. Got it. Finding your audience. So next week we'll be back. We do have another guest. Uh, Kate Schrott is going to come on next week. And we'll be going through page 154. Um, you can always rate and review us on Apple or wherever the fuck you get your podcasts from. Uh, we're on all of them apparently. Um, and I don't know, do you have anything you want to plug? I was going to plug that cultish book. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I, it's I'm, really interesting. That sounds really, I think it's very appropriate for what we're reading right now. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't checked it out, uh, King Kong theory, definitely worth a look. It's really cool. It's so good. It's so good. It's really short and it's a sneaky way of getting a little, Feminist theory. So check it out. Yeah. Who doesn't like King Kong? Yeah.